come to order. It is now 7.28 p.m. Good evening. I acknowledge on behalf of the Board of Trustees that this meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Liquita people. I am John Kerr, Chairperson of the School District 72 Board of Education. In attendance virtually this evening is Vice Chair Kat Eddy and Trustees Joyce McMahon, Susan Wilson, Daryl Hagan, and Richard Franklin. Sending her regrets is our is Trustee Shannon Briggs. I hope I haven't missed any trustees. Also in attendance are Superintendent Jeremy Morrill, Associate Superintendent Morgan Kyle, and Bill Sismic, as well as Secretary Treasurer Kevin Patrick. Present also are Natalie Crawshaw, Assistant to the Secretary Treasurer, Jennifer Patrick, Community Engagement Officer, and, and providing a technical support is Barbara Drake, Manager of IT. Please note that there's a three minute production delay between the live event that you are viewing and the meeting participants. The question and answer function is open for questions on the agenda items for this virtual meeting. Questions that are posted during the meeting will be addressed at the end of the session. The board continues to meet in a virtual format on the direct direction of district health officers office through the environmental safety officer. This step was taken in order to maintain compliance with the provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry's order, which restricts the board's ability to meet in person. While case numbers have seen a slight decline over the past week, the board will continue to meet virtually until such time as it is given direction that in-person meetings are permitted. Our board continues to take precautions and to make accommodations where possible to protect the health and safety of all members of our learning community. Over the past several days, the number of COVID-19 infections have decreased slightly. Since the board's last meeting, Island Health has issued exposure notices for two of the district's schools. Details were published in the local media last week. The risk of exposure in our schools continues to be a concern. The decreasing number of cases in the province and on the North Island is a good sign, but it is not time to lower our guard. Vaccination numbers are increasing, the weather is improving, and if everyone continues to do their part to ensure their safety and that of others, this scourge can be defeated. On April 16th and 17th, the British Columbia School Trustees Association held its annual general meeting in a virtual format. Over two days and almost 16 hours of meetings, trustees had the opportunity to listen to a keynote address by former BC Finance Minister Carol James, where she addressed the need for boards of education to reach out and engage with local groups to support and improve education. Participants also listened to a presentation by well-known educational thinker Andy Hargreaves and Abbotsford Superintendent Kevin Godden on educational inequality. During the business of the AGM, a new board of directors was elected and the president and vice president positions were acclaimed. 42 motions were debated, of which 40 were passed as, re as presented or as amended. School District 72 joined with School District 8 to propose a motion that would change the way in which the foundation skills assessment results would be aggregated and presented to school districts and parents so as to try to avoid the use or the misuse of the results to further a political agenda that seeks to discredit public education. The motion was amended and passed by more than two to one margin. Many of the motions passed reference the underfunding of services that are becoming increasingly important to the effective functioning of schools. Underfunding of mental health support services, failure to fully fund labor contracts, and the lack of funding for proper school maintenance and replacement were prominent in these motions. The government released the 2021-2022 provincial budget on April 10th. The Minister of Education highlighted, highlights increased education spending over the next three years but most of the increased funding is targeted at previously negotiated labor contracts and for projected enrollment growth. Additional capital funding is earmarked for seismic mitigation and expansion and replacement projects and asset rehabilitation and maintenance. How this affects School District 72 remains to be seen. With a decline in enrollment and additional expenses related to COVID-19, as well as a failure to include funding to address inflation, most districts across the province are facing deficit situations. Larger districts such as Surrey and Victoria and others are facing the possibility of service cuts in order to balance their budgets. Our district has over the years prudently managed its finances and it is anticipated that next year's budget will be able to be balanced with a minimum of disruption 
in part by drawing on its unrestricted reserves. These reserves are gradually being depleted, however, and at some point the board will need to make some hard decisions to compensate for this chronic underfunding. Finally, I would like to thank our students and staff for their continued efforts to keep everyone safe and to continue to learn and, and to teach under difficult and unprecedented circumstances. Thanks also to those trustees who spent a beautiful sunny weekend representing the School District 72 Board of Education doing the business of the School Trustees Association. Your efforts are making a difference. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, we will move on to the superintendent's remarks, Dr. Morrow. Yes, thank you very much, Board Chair Kerr. Um, I wanted to mention just a couple of upcoming events tonight. Uh, we'll start with recognizing that tomorrow is the day of mourning. It's in support of both WorkSafe BC as well as the BC Federation of Labor and the Business Council of BC. So school flags will be lowered to half mast in remembrance of workers tomorrow who have lost their lives as a result of workplace accidents and or occupational diseases. Yesterday was marked the start of rotation seven at our high schools this year in the Octec system. They've had, this is their seventh transition, which means we're three quarters of the way through the school year. And this is the time of year where as we near the end of one year, we're really starting to plan in earnest for the beginning of the next. And we are working towards uh, making sure that our students are given adequate opportunities to transition for especially for those students who are moving uh, between schools. So at this time, uh, while we have intention to ensure that all students are supported in that transition, if parents do have any uh, concerns about transition with their with their children or worried about uh, requiring additional supports, this is a great time to connect with schools uh, if you have any of those concerns. I wanted to just provide a quick note uh, of, of thanks to our parents who this year have contributed to our district through their participation in our district parent advisory council. They have been meeting via Zoom this year and they are consistently looking for ways to support students and their families. So thank you to our DPAC reps and those that are participating in supporting our, our students. Every board, every board meeting this year, I've provided an, an update in the public meeting regarding school exposures. And I am pleased tonight to report that there have been no school exposures since the evening of our last board meeting on April the 13th. We do know that school exposures reflect what is happening in the community, and I'm grateful for our community's contribution in making our schools as safe as possible. I wanted to acknowledge Georgia Park, who has just recently featured a class in our local paper for their collaborative project with Greenways Land Trust in removing invasive species in our community. Yesterday was a district professional development day. Schools uh, were responsible for developing their own professional development plans, which were also supplemented and supported with district uh, initiated professional development opportunities. So I'm just going to list a few of the things and workshops and opportunities that staff participated in yesterday. They participated in workshops related to child and youth mental health with trauma informed practice, workshops around innovation and education, literacy workshops, numeracy workshops, and mentorship and collaboration about around best practice, just to name a few. And I appreciate the commitment of our educators to continue to build adult capacity in our system to better meet the needs of our diverse learners. And then lastly tonight, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, our educational presenter tonight, uh, Manager of International Program Programs, Mercedes Hayduk. I'm looking forward to your presentation and just wanted to thank you and welcome you to the board meeting tonight. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. Okay, we'll move to the addition, pardon me, the approval of the minutes of the meeting of April 13, 2021. The proposed motion is that the minutes of the meeting of April 13, 2021 are hereby approved as circulated. Could we have a mover for that? Okay, Trustee Eddie and Trustee McMahon. Do we have any discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Opposed? The motion is carried. Okay, is there any business arising from the minutes? Hearing none, do we have any additions or alterations to the agenda? Trustee Hagen. You're on mute. You were muted, Trustee Hagen. Thank you. 
I uh, would like to talk about uh, board governance uh, under um, electric and board matters. Uh, I would like to talk about the committee that's being formed to involve students uh, as well as another item. And I would like to talk uh, about the t our teachers working in the district. So uh, three separate items. So student representation. Yes. The second one was. Uh, board governance. Oh, OK, I'm sorry, I thought they were the same one. OK, board governance and the third one is. Is uh, I want to talk uh, about our teachers in the district for a minute. Right. So to help with uh, recording, I have board governance as 12A. Um, student committee, would that also be electorate and board matters under 12B? And um, the, the teachers, is that a electorate and board matters or should that be any other business? Could be any other business, yes. So we'll do teachers as 16A. Okay. Are there any other additions to the agenda or alterations? OK, hearing none, then the proposed motion would be that the agenda is hereby approved as amended. Could we have a mover for that, please? Moved by Trustee Wilson, seconded by Trustee Eddy. Is there any discussion on that? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. OK, opposed, the motion is passed. All right, we've, we shall then move to um, the report of board decisions from the April 27, 2021 confidential board meeting. Trustee Eddy. During the confidential meeting, the um, Board of Education discussed matters pertaining to lands, legal and staffing. We have not had an opportunity to complete our agenda and we will be going back after the public meeting. All right. There is no correspondence, public submission and agenda submissions, so we will move to education, educational submissions and I'll call on Ms. Hayduk. Thank you, Board Chair Kerr and Honourable Trustees and colleagues. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm Really excited to share the story of International with you. I actually get to share our story on a daily basis. I talk to people all over the world. I get to talk about our community, our schools, our host families. And so it's really is a pleasure for me to share it with you today as well. This is my first time as manager of International Student Programs to present to the board. So I wanted to take a moment and introduce myself to you. Uh, my story goes back to 2012 when I first was introduced to the international program here under Joanne Preston. My family and I welcomed our interna an international student into our home as host parents. We had a lovely young woman from Germany who stayed with us for the year. She became an older sister to my daughters. She became like a, my German daughter and um, we still have since from that day we have continued contact with her. She's finishing out her, she's in her last year at the University of Munich, getting her mechanical engineering degree. And she often credits my husband for her passion for physics. My husband is a science and math teacher at Cary High. So I know firsthand the benefit of the international students and the lifelong connections that we have by having them here in our community. In 2012, not only did I become a host parent, I also became an activity coordinator for our program. So I was contracted to provide activities for the students. Uh, we provide two activities a month in non-COVID times, of course, where we something simple like ice skating or um, bowling and also trips to Vancouver, Victoria, so that the students can experience uh, the beautiful area that we live in. Soon after that, I became the home state coordinator, working more closely with our host families and all of the international students. And I did that for several years. And since June of 2018, I've had the privilege of managing this program. My role now is primarily to support my partners abroad, maintain these relationships, 
and support my staff here and our students here in Candle River and ensure the smooth operation of our international program, which I'm sure you can imagine in this current environment um, is no small feat. But one of the things that I've learned this past year is that it requires an ability to pivot, requires resiliency, um, and it requires the ability to adapt to each new situation as it arises. And myself and my team have done an exceptional job of doing that this past year. And I have absolute confidence that moving forward, we'll be able to adapt to any new situa situation as it comes up. I wanna take a moment and introduce my team as well because they are instrumental in the international student program here. We have Karen Giesbricht, who's our international admin assistant. She's part-time for our program. She liaises with our partners abroad. She manages the finances on the back end and registrations for our students. She has incredible professionalism and grace, and those shine through in all her interactions with our partners. We have Kim Stix, who is our academic advisor. You may recognize her name as the district ELL coordinator. And her connection to international actually goes back to her days of teaching ESL in Asia. Kim brought her ESL expertise to our school district several years ago and to our ELL learners at our high schools. She provides, as the district ELL coordinator, she provides an important service to our ELL teachers and our newcomers to Campbell River. But as the academic advisor to our program, she focuses on academic supports for our international students so that they are successful in all things that have to do with school. She also brings an intercultural lens to an understanding to our students of what it means to study here in a different educational environment for them, a different culture. And she also brings that intercultural lens to our teachers so they understand some of the backgrounds of our students. We also have Rhonda, our home state coordinator, arguably, arguably the most important piece um, uh, for our program. She's responsible for maintaining the relationship between our students and our host families and ensuring that all parties are happy and successful in their relationships. Rhonda has joined us in the fall of 2018 and she brings her expertise as an early childhood educator and her amazing ability to connect and relate to the teenagers in our program. Our program believes very strongly in a high level of support for our students. And Rhonda has focused, as actually Kim Stex as well, both have done some professional development in the mental health areas to ensure that we continue to provide a high level of support to all of our international students. Of course, the added complexities of cultural differences, um, it's a team effort for all of us working together. We regularly collaborate, the three of us, uh, working closely together to focus on the well, wellness and well-being of our international students. So the story of international is partly the team, but it's partly of what we offer international students when they're coming here to study. We're very fortunate to have a small and intimate program that focuses on those connections and those relationships. The culture of our program was established long ago by my predecessors, Joanne Preston and Lori Kobolak. And that culture of connection and relationship continues today with the student-centered approach that we take with all of our students. I, I um, regularly, the first thing I do when the students come and when we have an orientation with our students, the first thing I tell them is that study abroad is the best gift that you will give yourself. And I don't think the students really understand that in the beginning, but it's not until later that they fully understand the growth they achieve through their time here. I spoke with one of my students just yesterday, uh, a boy from Japan. He arrived in September with a very little level of English. And I remember in September how frustrated he was that he was unable to communicate. He couldn't fully express, he could barely express himself and what he was feeling, but he had this fierce independence that he really wanted to. And I was amazed. And I'm not sure why I was amazed because I know this is what happens. But yesterday when we spoke, it was an amazing conversation. And I said to him, you must be so proud of the work that you've done over the last few months being here because there was no difficulty in us conversing, talking about next year and what he wanted to do and what was making him happy. This boy will be with us for three years. He will be one of our returning students to graduate here. So I want to share with you a couple of slides because I do believe images are the best way to um, 
share some parts of our story. So I uh, just give me a minute. And please let me know if you don't see this presentation. Just one moment. OK, hopefully you all see the slide for our board presentation. I'll just take one minute to say that we're very fortunate living in such a picturesque environment that we do that 99% of our marketing materials are actually students, pictures of our students, our host families. And here, this was a picture taken by our students a few years ago on one of our trips to Tofino. I want to introduce you to Kylie. Kylie is a recent, very recent graduate of Timberline. She just finished her last course here. She's been here for three years, staying with uh, the Castle family. She's pictured here with her host mom, Marianne Castle. You can see them, of course, beaming uh, on the top of Ripple Rock. Uh, Kylie is a brilliant student. She is off to study medicinal chemistry at the University of Waterloo. She's dropped by my office earlier this week, or late last week, actually, with Marianne. And uh, it was it was amazing to see the tears in Marianne's eyes as we said our goodbyes from a distance, of course. This is another picture that a, one of my students shared with me. This is Teresa on the right. She's from Germany. She arrived for the second semester, so at the end of January, and she had an absolutely fantastic time with her host family over spring break. And obviously from the from this picture, you can tell that she had a great day on the water with her host family. So I mentioned earlier that study abroad is the best gift for um, students, best gift that they can give themselves. And I would also argue that study abroad is the best gift that these students give to our community, these connections, our host families, the staff, our students at our schools, they all benefit from the gift of international programs. Our host families, again, these are families that have been hosting with us for many, many years, and they're just out doing what they do with our students, which is enjoying the incredible scenery and environment that we have the privilege of living in. We have all kinds of host families. Some have kids, some have teenagers, and some have no kids and all of them provide amazing environments for our students. I wanted to also take a moment and share some feedback from our partners and their perception of our program. For a variety of reasons, I've recently received some direct feedback and direct quotes from our partners as we've um, worked through some different situations. One of them, um, I did recently speak with a natural parent in Spain who was concerned about his daughter, and I knew that if I spoke with him directly, I would be able to alleviate some of his fears and our partner was so impressed that I took the time to do that and commented on our professional contact. Regularly our partners comment on the amazing host families that our program has and how much we put the students first in all that we do. I was also on Facebook the other night and came across one of my host families posts who just posted an old photo of one of their former students and commented on how amazing the experience to host students is for their family, which started a bunch of other posts from other host families. And so I took those quotes right off of Facebook the other day, and I wanted to share those with you tonight. So I want to now talk a little bit about running an international program during a pandemic and what it means to do so, because this year has been exceptional for all of us. But communication and communication is something that we've learned is very, very important. Providing virtual meetings, continue to meet with our host parents. We can't do it in person anymore, but we can certainly provide virtual meetings with our host parents. And something new that we did this year was pre-departure meetings with students and natural parents. Obviously, there's some heightened concern about traveling in this, in this environment. And I wanted natural parents and students to know that there was a real person on the other end when they land in Vancouver. Students connect with me the moment they walk off the plane in Vancouver. We're in direct contact so that I can support them every step of the way on the remaining trip to Campbell River. We pivoted well last year, about a year ago, actually exactly to this day. We, I started right away with one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings 
obviously there was going to be no travel for some time, but virtual is a great way to have meetings. It saves the environment and the time of traveling. So we pivoted to the virtual meetings and I find now that many of our agent fairs are online, which have worked really, really well. And some of these best practices for virtual are gonna remain for the future. I also wanna take a moment and talk about what it takes to actually bring a student into uh, Canada in this environment. You should know that the protocols have all been put in place by the Federal Health Authority, PHAC, Provincial Health, and we have our own protocols here that are approved by our lo local health office. Students are tested 72 hours prior to their arrival. They're tested upon arrival into the Vancouver airport, and then they're tested on day eight of their 14-day quarantine. That was recently day 10, but just changed to day eight. For us, we support the students every day of their quarantine meeting with them twice a day and doing an online orientation for the, stu for the students while providing mental health and wellness supports. I am very happy to say that so far feedback from host families and students has been um, very high marks for their quarantine experience, not as bad as they thought it was going to be. And it's also, I give credit to my predecessors that our program runs as a self-sustainable pro pro program. We have reduced some staffing to accommodate this year, and I'll get into our numbers in just a moment. But it is important to note that uh, here in Campbell River, International operates as a self-sustainable program. So some enrollment history for you. I decided to go back to 2016, 2017, just to go back a few years. You can see sort of in the three years around there, we were about um, 60 either side of 60 students. And for budget purposes, we calculated on a, uh, an FTE, which is so 46, around 46 FTE there for those few years. We did see a big jump in 2019, 2020 to 61 FTE. So the future was looking great until uh, March of 2020. And of course the numbers for this year, 18.4 uh, FTE or 32 students reflect um, a year where it was difficult for students to travel to Canada to, for study abroad. It is amazing though that we do have 25 students with us here right now enjoy, enjoying Campbell River. So I do want to share a little bit about one of the biggest questions I get is who are these students? Where do they come from? And predominantly our students come from Europe. These are our 2019-2020 numbers. 59% uh, of our students came from Europe, predominantly Germany, after that Spain and Italy. 33% came from Asia, and that's mostly Japan and Taiwan. We've been accepting students from Japan and Taiwan for a very long time. And usually there's one or two students from mainland China. And then always a few students from Latin America, which is predominantly Brazil and uh, one or two from Brazil and Mexico. Flash forward to next year, and uh, I can say that I, I won't count the numbers for this year because I don't think they'll reflect accurately our, our program. But moving forward next year, the majority of our students are coming from Europe. Latin America has fallen off. Um, we don't have any students from Latin America. If you're following the news, you would know that things in Brazil are not good. So where there are hot spots, it is difficult for students to visit the VACs, which are the visa application centers. It's difficult for them to get, it's impossible for them to get a study permit to travel to Canada. So no students from Latin America for next year. And so 15% of our students will come from Asia. And some of those students are some of our Japanese students who are here right now intending to return next year. They'll actually stay with us over the summer rather than spend half their summer in quarantine, traveling back to Japan and coming back. They will stay with us over the summer. And so we have a group of Japanese students who will be here with us in September, as well as a couple of students from Taiwan who are arriving, but predominantly European students. So for international, the future is bright. Campbell River is positioned well. We have very, very strong relationships with our partners. We're deeply respected. We continue to meet new partners and we've signed 15 new partnerships this past year. Our story, our why is, is the reason for our success. And I think our partners recognize that. We have stopped taking new applications for September. Our program is full. We are at 
55 students, which is 48 FDE for September, so that we can now focus on onboarding host families. We have a great group of our core group of host families, of course, but it is time to look for new host families. For the future, I'm just going to stop sharing this. So the focus moving forward will be um, onboarding new host families. So I do ask my colleagues and honorable trustees, if you know anyone who might want to benefit from the international student experience, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But thanks again for your time this evening. It's been a pleasure uh, to share a little bit about international and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mercedes? Richard. Yeah, you know, having hosted an international student in my house for a while, it is uh, a great experience for for both uh, the host and the and the party who's come. And I just want to congratulate you on a very successful program and uh, one that is I really appreciate. Thank you, Trustee. Franklin, for your very kind words. Uh, Trustee Wilson. Hi, thanks. I couldn't find my hand. Um, <laughs> Mercedes, thank you very much for that. It was a really interesting um, program. I don't think I quite understood uh, some of the background issues that you brought forward. And um, also very interesting to hear how you pivoted and were flexible dealing with uh, COVID. And I'm glad to hear that some of those um, best practices will now be carried forward. So it sounds like we're, uh, you know, came through a rough patch, but we're going forward with lots of strength. So thank you very much for your leadership there. Thank you, Trustee Wilson, for your kind words. I'm very, upper, I feel very optimistic about the future for our program. It, it is, we still, it's very, a lot of uncertainty between now and September. Um, I think we've talked about it's, Anything can happen between now and September, but even if it's still bumpy, we will come out ahead for our program. I would just like to comment that uh, those students all bring something to our district and to the people that they interact with in the schools that they're that they're in. So it's really great that we have such a, I guess, such a vibrant program going on in our district. Thank you, Trustee Kerr. It is. I have so many positive stories and so many stories of students traveling abroad and host families traveling to visit their former students. We're very fortunate here that we have these connections. Are there other comments? Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Very optimistic, so thank you. Okay, um, we will then move into the next item, which is electorate and board matters, and uh, let me see if I've got this right. So we have um, Trustee Hagen, you wanted to speak to board governance? Yes, I did. Um, I've noticed over the past while that we, we started down this road of uh, uh, to create a governance board. And I think it's always good to uh, review what we've done, how far we've gone, and how we can do things better. Uh, I think we're at that point now where we need to review what we're doing. I just see in lots of areas that uh, we deal with that there are gray areas, and I'm not saying everything has to be black and white. I'm simply saying that what we need is more trustee involvement in some of the decision making, not telling people what to do in the educational side, but to be more involved in the decision making uh, that occurs in, I could give examples, let's say the hiring of uh, people from out of district, what kind of leadership skills are they gonna be bringing? Uh, what kind of uh, moves are happening within our district and how come they're occurring? And I think it's time to review, okay, perhaps like a pendulum, have we gone too far? I don't have my mind made up. I have heard lots of things I'd like to bring up, but I'd like to hear first uh, how we do with a review so that we can ask ourselves, are we doing the job correctly? Is this where we wanted to see us uh, when we started the process? And I think it's 
timely that we did that because if we keep going, my feeling is, is that we're going to make tr school trustees fairly obsolete. And uh, I think we were uh, elected as local trustees to represent the local issues and to make decisions uh, beyond where we are right now, not just a, big, a few big picture ideas, but to gain momentum uh, and to gain an enthusiasm in, in the school district itself for what school trustees do and represent their philosophies and can be seen to be involved in those decision-making processes. So I would suggest that we, we uh, create a process where we can come up with a fair review that would include management because I'm sure that they may have concerns as far as, oh, that's a gray area, I'm not sure. Or I think trustees should be involved in this decision-making. And I think it's always good to measure when we start something to see where we are. Do you have a motion for that? I would move that uh, the board uh, begins a process, including uh, senior management of, and of their choice and of our choice, uh, as far as trustees, to uh, revisit our and uh, measure the successes and perhaps shortcomings of moving down this road to uh, governance board governance. I know that there was a sudden push across the whole province, and yet I see some of our organizations uh, uh, don't seem to really be listening to local trustees. And I think we need to say, okay, uh, at some point they're gonna say, we don't even need you. We can just have uh, governors or we'll, we can appoint somebody else. I think our job is critical. Uh, we're from here. Uh, we we do this uh, work. It's sometimes difficult and hard, but because we care for kids and we want what's best. And I'm just wondering. So the motion would be is that we create a uh, a committee involving management and trustees to review uh, our board governance uh, process or uh, progress. All right. Do we have a second for that motion? Trustee Franklin. Okay, um, Trustee Hagen, you've spoken to it. Does anyone else wish to speak to it? Trustee Franklin. Well, I seconded the motion because I uh, thought that uh, Trustee Hagen's idea to just examine is the is the board governance model we're using uh, does it work for us? uh and uh it was quite a shift um i think in large part um, the board governance model works very well as it, as it does now but it always should be subject to review to find that balance between uh you know where where do you draw the line and and what kind of decisions should a board be in, involved in um it's always good to look at that uh so uh i think uh, introspection is good so that's why i support this motion other comments trustee wilson and then eddie i i think as well that it's a good idea but i question the timing i think that our senior management is um very, very um, focused on other uh, important issues at this time. And perhaps this motion could be tabled until the fall and revisited when so many of the startup um, procedures have been, uh, are underway. Um, and then that would give us perhaps more continuity to look at things at that point. Um, are you going to make a motion to table? Would I do that now or after further discussion? I'm going to ask our parliamentarian, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can make a motion to table. OK, I move to table the motion put forward by Trustee Hagen until the fall, September mm -hmm. 2021. Do we have a seconder? 
I'll second that. Trustee Eddy. Do you want to, you've spoken to it somewhat now, to... Trustee Wilson, so did you have more to say? I, no. I, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Trustee Eddy, then and Trustee Hagan. Um, I agree with both Trustee Hagan and Trustee Wilson. Um, I do think that it's important to review our work as a board and our contribution to our community in benefit of our children. Um, I do st I do think that we just went through a pretty rigorous board self-evaluation process with an excellent leader in uh, Jim Cambridge. And I am concerned, as Susan is, that we are tasking senior management to, I don't think that there's the energy right now to really do a deeper dive into our governance structure and ask our senior management teams to be actively participating on a regular basis in that. And that's why I support Susan's um, motion to table it until we have some more capacity. Trustee Hagan. Yes, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Morrow if uh, he foresees uh, it being quite an intrusive process or one that where we, as we make decisions where we could define Oh, these, there's, there's another moment when trustees should be involved. If it could be a, an ongoing process, but I'll leave that to him. Trustee Morrow, or sorry, Superintendent Morrow, would you like to respond? Well, I think um, I would just echo some of the comments, uh, particularly the comment that the board has just gone through a, a fairly thorough um, board review process of which one of the recommendations was that we actually spend some time uh, teasing out some of those complexities in the governance uh, model that looks at some of those gray areas. So um, if that's a report uh, right now, I think it would be difficult for us to produce that report, but I think if it's a conversation and dialogue based, then certainly uh, we could welcome that conversation much earlier than a report would be able to be generated. But uh, whether we, we look at some scenarios and, and, and work through that uh, together as a team to help really tease out those delineations between operations uh, and governance. Is there other discussion on the motion? Okay, on the motion, no, Trustee Franklin. Well, you know, a, a totally other other way to, to do uh, this kind of work is just by amending policy as you go. And then, you know, you don't have to tease out the whole thing all at once. You can tease out one thing at a time. You know, so if a board, for example, decided that they needed more something, some more, more ability to give direction to the superintendent in different areas. That's basically what it is. It's a, the push pull of, of uh, uh, jurisdiction. And uh, so, you know, another way to do it is say, you know, as a trustee, you're looking at the policies or something's not sitting well with you. Well, what there is going to be a policy that applies to jurisdiction and uh, you can find that in our policy book and that and then work on that piece of the problem because I think in general the governance model is an excellent model but it's always open to fine tuning <laughs> you know what I mean so uh, that's just another approach rather than sort of holos bolos look at governance is to deal with with issues as they come and that our, our board has done that in the past few years and we have significantly changed board policy piece by piece by piece okay thank you trustee franklin and trustee hagan well that was actually what i had envisioned was is that issues as issues arrive when the superintendent or uh, the board office feels you know, I wonder why trustees aren't involved in this or how come we're not doing this at this time or whose area is it that we begin a discussion so that we just don't leave things run the way they are. I would like to see a more of the district build an allegiance, not allegiance, not just to the superintendent, but to the school board. Uh, and that's that's where I'd like to go, because in the end, superintendents change and trustees change but the, the school board will be here. And so uh, my feeling is, is if we can fine tune as we're, as we're moving forward, we'll pick up the issues and not make it a huge study, but just pick up the issues and say, yeah, 
we should be involved in that or no, it's working just fine. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the motion to table? Trustee Franklin? Well, I mean, I think you could table it forever, but why don't we just table it for now? And, uh, but carry on with our process of, of dealing directly uh, with issues as they come up in terms of governance and jurisdiction. Okay. So the motion was to table it until September, I believe. Is that correct, uh, yes. Mr. Patrick? Yes. Okay, is there any any further discussion then? All those in favor of the motion to table the motion on governance until September, please raise your hands. Opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. All right, thank you very much. So now we will move on to um, business administration and we'll move into the climate action report. Mr. Woods. Sorry, um, Chair Carr, but we have uh, 12B, uh, the student uh, representation oh, committee as well. My fault. I, I apologize for skipping over that. So we'll move into uh, 12B then, which is the student representation and Trustee Hagen, you wish to speak to that. Yes, I just wanted to question Jeremy. Uh, I think that uh, we're going to be moving forward with this, uh, with the motion that went forward. Uh, as far as uh, student involvement, I was wondering how you had envisioned that or have you still need some more time? I was hoping that in, in that again, that trustees often feel quite disassociated with uh, with some of the students and yet all of our work is that paper coming out of the end of the paper machine who I'd really like to get to know what their ideas are and uh, what they would like to have happen with their education. So I was just wondering, Jeremy, how you envisioned that. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the question, uh, Trustee Hagen. Um, we have uh, in, in operational or in board governance policy 28 uh, an articulation of, uh, of a goal to have two student representatives from each of the middle uh, and secondary schools, which includes, uh, of course, Rob Run is one of the secondary schools. Um, with that group of, of 10 students, uh, we want the vision is to see that group of 10 students working very closely with an appointed uh, trustee to, to that committee and to work as a liaison with issues that are raised uh, on behalf of trustees uh, to those students and, and for those students um, to provide information to trustees to help guide decision making. So um, I think that this will be a, a group of young people who will be uh, you know, selected and, and given the opportunity because they have a vested interest in informing policy and communicating with trustees around those things that matter most to students. And, uh, and I think it will give trustees, uh, you know, and I know trustees have asked for that opportunity to have uh, uh, decisions um, and processes influenced by student voice. And I think this group will provide that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that? Okay, thank you, Trustee Hagen. Um, so now we will move into item 14A, Climate Action Report. Uh, Director of Operations, Mr. Steve Wood. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, manager of Operations, but I'll accept Sorry. the uh, <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> Um, I'll just dive right in. Uh, thank you very much. A copy of the presentation is included in your board package, so uh, I'll just go ahead and test my ability to use technology and do a share screen. There we go. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah, you all know me. I'm Steve Woods, Manager of Operations. Sadly, I'm also a professional engineer, so I tend to use numbers and graphs a little bit more than I should. So uh, just bear with me and we'll get through this. Um, so I wanted to start out with uh, just reinforcing that uh, greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption, they're deeply intertwined. And so you really can't talk about either one of those subjects without kind of taking a, a, a view of really what's happening in your, in your buildings. Uh, this particular uh, slide, it uh, gives you a, a very quick profile of the peaks uh, that happen during the winter months of, in energy consumption and the valleys in the summer when there's warmer weather and less generally less activity in our in our schools. 
And you you can see the, you know, it's it's really combined electricity, natural gas. There is a sliver of green in there for fuel oil. We have, uh, you know, Serge Narrow's elementary is uh, is in there. It's uh, just a very small school, so it doesn't show well in this particular graph. Uh, we use propane on two of our schools uh, for heat. And um, the uh, the dark green line or black line, it, uh, it um, kind of smooths out uh, the peaks and valleys to give you, uh, you know, a 12 month rolling average of what's going on. And so the, the good news is that since 2007, you can see that generally we've had a, a pretty consistent decline in the amount of energy uh, that, that we use. And I was thinking, you know, why 2007? Like my recollection is that in 2008, 2009, it's when the uh, BC provincial government began to introduce climate action targets, and 2007 was a was a benchmark year for the first you know the first for that iteration of um, of legislation. So, of course, uh, using energy, uh, it, you know, by extension, uh, requires you you pay your utility bills, and so you you can see here again. Um, you know, how the different types of energy that we consume contribute to the costs uh, that the school district uh, incurs, um, but it's not quite as smooth a graph. And I think you can appreciate that over the years, um, uh, it, although we do reduce our energy consumption, we're also subject to rate changes or, you know, and that, and that it's just not as smooth, a, it's just not as smooth a graph. So, um, still a good trend, but it's just not as clear as uh, as the previous slide. Well, some of the factors that uh, uh, influence um, energy use and cost. Um, obviously, the heating season is the most significant, and it's a really strong correlation. I, I did the math a few years ago. It's it really dominates um, our energy profile. Um, for those who have a longer memory. Um, you know what what we've done uh, collectively to our infrastructure over the years we've added buildings uh, modular buildings portables uh willow point was expanded a few years ago we've also managed to shed some energy uh, consumption through disposals of campbellton rockland evergreen and we've also reconfigured uh, some buildings in in particular the heritage lands complex and the reconfigurations allow us to consolidate um you know, where our activity is focused and uh, how much energy is required to support, um, you know, th those sites. Changes in use also affect energy consumption. So school closures, you know, so uh, something like Discovery Passage or Oyster River, those buildings still remain in our inventory, but they're not as energy intensive as they were when they were an active school site. Changes in the number of staff and students. Um, I think that's kind of self-evident. Uh, converting space. So you convert a classroom into a computer lab. The computer lab will generally use more, have a, have a higher electricity demand and, and uh, cooling demand. Conversely, a storage area, relatively low uh, energy consumption. And the amount of space that uh, is leased out. And so, you know sometimes tenants will have different energy needs than say a classroom. The amount of after hours use in a facility will also dictate how much energy you require, uh, primarily for heating, but also for lighting. So we also change our facilities. We're always doing uh, facility upgrades, uh, boiler upgrades, uh, additional lighting, um, roofing projects. Uh, we're always trying to find ways to be more energy efficient. And the nice part is that it, 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 in most cases, these enhance the uh, you know, the, com the comfort of the student in the, in the classroom. Operating parameters will also affect um, energy requirements. So um, in the current um, environment, uh, there's a lot of uh, attention being paid to ventilation rates. Uh, we have uh, gone to a more efficient filter um, uh, throughout our HVAC system, but that of course needs more energy to push the air through the filter. Um, we also periodically uh, try different tactics uh, to um, make, make schools less attractive for after hours activity. So we would uh, leave the lights on longer uh, in some cases. In other cases, we try turning off the lights a little bit earlier. Uh, it's, a, it's a trial and error process. 
So that, all those things affect energy uh, use. Of course, utility rates are we're, we're a price taker in most cases. Um, really, the only thing that we can do about utility rates is make sure that we're being billed at the appropriate uh, rate uh, for the um, energy profile that we have. We we uh, we compare um, energy use, energy use intensity, and so. Um, um, this this kind of shows the ranking of our current uh, infrastructure. Uh, school board office is the highest uh, energy uh, consumer in the in the district. That is very, in fact, that is common in all school districts. You any any district that I've talked to, school board office is the is you know they they need a lot of energy. I think it's because so much of our uh, information technology infrastructure is located in the building. So uh, that is not a surprising result by any means. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, Surgeon Hours Elementary. Um, gigajoules per square meter per year, that's, you know, that is the most efficient uh, uh, school in, in our inventory. And in between that, you have all the other uh, schools, generally high schools will have a higher energy intensity than elementary schools. Um, we use this kind of uh, comparison though to help identify where we should be focusing um, our energy conservation projects. So for example, Ripper Walk Elementary is, is fairly high and we have a project to, it's due for a boiler replacement. And I would anticipate that once uh, funding is identified for that, um, that, that school will improve in, in the amount of energy that it, use, it requires. So, with all that talk of uh, energy, um, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, again, uh, through conversion factors uh, provided by uh, the provincial government, we can translate the amount of energy that we use into the tons of CO2 equivalent uh, that uh, we generate. So again, um, you'll note on the left-hand side uh, that matches up with the vertical bars. Um, so fossil fuels, so, for 2008 from zero to 2100 uh, tons um, is fossil fuels. That's, so that's propane, uh, natural gas. Um, and, the, and our, our surge narrows with our, our little bit of diesel. And then you have our fleet and the fleet consists of our white fleet used by the maintenance uh, shops. It also consists of our school buses. And we have electricity. And then office supply. So we we uh, track and report on office paper consumption throughout the school district. So again, it, the the pattern isn't as clear as the earlier graphs, but you can see that overall uh, we have a we have a positive trend of being able to reduce our greenhouse gas consumption. The orange line represents exempt emissions. So school buses, uh, we are not required to pay a carbon offset on uh, emissions from our school buses. And you can see it bounces, you know, the line bounces around a little bit more. On the right hand side is the uh, tons of CO2 equivalent uh, that go with that. And um, perhaps the most notable thing out of, uh, out of the orange line is what happened in 2020 with COVID. And you can see a significant drop in um, our exempt emissions because there was less busing happening uh, for certain parts of the last spring. So how do we how do we get these kinds of results? Well, it's primarily uh, through energy conservation projects, and that's not to minimize the um, the initiatives taken at the school level with students, um, but those are those are quite hard to quantify. Uh, whereas uh, projects like these, um, uh, you know, we, we're able to produce reports and and work out you know calculate out what the what the um, potential savings are. So last year, our top four projects, um, two of them were uh, life cycle replacement of roofing. And um, those are, you know, uh, funded, uh, were funded uh, either directly through the Ministry of Education or a, fun, a, a mix of Ministry of Education and our annual facilities grant. So every time we replace a roof, uh, we try to increase the uh, insulative value, the R value, and we try to put a we we try to put a reflective coating on the roof to help reflect heat. Uh, in recent years, we've uh, put a lot of investment into boilers and mechanical upgrades, and um, again, um, Ministry of Education annual facilities grant 
And we also get uh, rebates in, in many cases through uh, Fortis BC. Um, so it's a, it's a good program and these are life cycle conversions. So we just don't do it because, you know, we need energy savings. We do it because the boiler or the ventilator needs replacing and we're electing to pay a, a small premium to go to high, high efficiency um, uh, technologies. For this year, um, I've, I've selected four projects uh, that best demonstrate um, our use of uh, trying to improve our infrastructure. Uh, Cedar Annex, uh, again, uh, another roof replacement funded through the annual facilities grant. Again, we're trying to, we're going to, aside from keeping the water out of the building, uh, we're going to try to improve the insulation and, and put a reflective roof on it. Uh, Penfield Elementary is a significant project. Um, 975,000 through our, our capital plan. And it's, but it's the same type of approach. Uh, improve the insulation, put a reflective coating on it. And we're also uh, taking this as an opportunity to uh, do some corrective maintenance on the, uh, the, the main skylight in that building. Um, and, and, you know, it's just going to be a more efficient skylight. It's not going to leak as much heat through the, through the, through the ceiling. Uh, carry high boiler replacement. Again, uh, life cycle replacement going to a high efficiency product and and we've put a lot of effort in carry high over the last few years. Um, uh, just phasing the projects out and this is our last phase of uh, the series of those carry high upgrade uh, mechanical upgrades. And Penfield, uh, we're uh, we're still in development uh, design development with this project, but uh, we've got four four uh, classrooms left where uh, the the old Herman Nelsons are going to be replaced with high efficiency units and and we're trying to standardize our technology um, with other schools. So it actually helps our maintenance uh, costs as well by um, not having as diverse a, a portfolio of assets. So the bottom line, um, if you sift through those uh, those graphs um, since 2007, uh, you'll, you'll see it's about a 30% reduction in energy use. Uh, that's equivalent to about a 15% reduction in energy costs. But I'll, I'll just put a, a caveat in there that um, we, don't, um, we don't include the indirect costs such as carbon offsets that we, we pay in order to be um, deemed a carbon neutral organization. And also not included, or I'll, I'll call it an apples to apples comparison, is that the carbon tax is a relatively new um, tool uh, introduced by the government. And so 2007, that didn't exist, whereas it does now. So, I mean, if I were able to strip out the carbon tax, you, you might see a little bit higher reduction than uh, what I'm able to report. So between uh, energy, you know, with energy use uh, and, you know, it works out to about a 33% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, you know, it's not 30% because natural gas has a, a little bit higher carbon footprint than um, our BC Hydro with, with um, you know, it's all based out of dams and, and uh, you know, low carbon um, ways of generating electricity. So that's, uh, that's the overview. Um, we, we do report to the um, Climate Action Secretary every year by, by regulation. Um, uh, up until this year, it was called the Carbon Neutral Action Report. Now it's called the Climate Change Accountability Report. Um, that document really though, the, the deep dive is in the strategic energy management plan. You can get a lot of detail out of that. So I've, I've listed for convenience the, the website, but it's fairly easy to find it on our school district webpage. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Woods? None? Uh, Trustee Kerr. Uh, sorry. Okay. Trustee Eddie, and then I think Mc, Trustee McMahon, did you have your hand up as well? And then, okay. So, Trustee Eddie, Trustee McMahon, Trustee Hagan. Um, Steve, I just want to thank you for spending the time to do the deep dive and take all your engineering background to compile this information into engageable reports because it's a lot of information coming from a lot of different sites. And as a non-engineer, it would have been difficult for me to disseminate it. I do have a question on that graph when you were um, outlining the schools. 
Um, why is Cortez so much higher? Like, why is Cortez right up there with Purple Rock? Isn't it a smaller school? There's a there's a couple of items in play. Um, one, you know, first of all, Cort Cortez. Well, Cortez is one of our propane sites, um, so it naturally has a little bit different profile than you know a site that would be natural gas or electricity. Um, we've had some interesting challenges over the years, and and Cortez went through a a, a seismic upgrade, so it, it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, one of the puzzles that we haven't quite figured out is the ventilation system in the schools. It used to be a passive system, and um, we found that when we were doing the seismic upgrade, there was a lot of air leakage going on there, and I and I don't think we've quite figured out um, how to fully correct that. It is a project that I have on the AFG. Um, so I, I agree that there's some opportunities there, but it's going to take a, a little bit more thought than um, we are able to, you know, we've been able to put in so far. But I will say that Cortez, it actually is a lot better than it used to be one of our high, I'll, I'll say one of our highest, it was probably the highest at one point. Um, no, it's, it's better than it was, but lots of room for improvement for sure. Thanks, Steve. Trustee McMahon. Yes, um, I echo Trustee Eddie's appreciation for your report, Steve. I love graphs. Um, Excellent. Uh, but my question, my question for you is around cedar. Is the um, level of of usage for cedar related to aging infrastructure or? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair comment. Um, you know, older buildings. You know, it, it's, I won't say it's a general rule, but you know, depending on the on the the design of the building, it's it's really hard to um, take out a wall and beef up the insulation and then replace it. Um, we've we've done it in a few sites through our building envelope program. Cedar is not one of those buildings, and so we we have improved. The roof has been re, you know largely replaced and is much more energy efficient. We have done the lighting. We've done the boilers. But at the end of the day, it's it's pretty, and we need to do the windows. Uh, but at the end of the day, the walls are the walls, and uh, unless you make a more significant investment, um, it's going to be really hard to stop the air leakage, you know, through just through the walls. Okay, thank you, Trustee Hagen. Thank you. Oh, did you have more, uh, Trustee McMahon? No, just a okay. thanks. All right, Trustee Hagen. Hey, thanks, sir for the resolve to uh, keep this pushing forward. It's nice to see the reduction in our footprint, you know, in this area. It's something the whole world is working on and it's nice to see results uh, that we can, at least where we are, where we live and we go to school, uh, we're working uh -huh. towards, uh, you know, progress and I see it. And I'd like to thank you for, for your hard work and just being determined to reduce our footprint and thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to thank you just for your efforts. In like it, you've been very persistent on this, and we we've seen the results just in the, you know, in the reduction of our carbon footprint. But you've also been very efficient in minimizing the cost to the district by accessing grants from very you know various and assorted organizations that uh, can help us out. So. I think one of the things that maybe we don't realize is how much money the board has doesn't hasn't had to pay out because you have been so diligent and efficient and effective at uh, accessing those grants that are available there. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, Trustee Wilson. I'll just add my thanks to other folks. Um, Steve, your presentation is really clear uh, and I really appreciate all the work that's gone behind it. And thank you for making it understandable. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much. OK, okay we will move on to item 14B, finance warrant number two, February 28, 2021. Um, Secretary Treasurer Patrick, did you want to speak to that? I'm just looking for approval from the board for a finance warrant from February. Okay. 
So the suggest did you want to speak to that or can I? No, I was going to move it. Motion? All right. So the suggested motion is that the finance warrant number two, uh, dated February 28, 2021, be accepted as presented. Moved Hagen, seconded by no. Franklin. I have a comment, Mr. Trustee or by Chair. All minutes, go ahead. Uh, I just have a question about finance warrant to uh, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. Um, the transfers on the first page, the transfer to Silver Savings Account. Can you explain to me what that is? Is that for teachers that draw salaries for 12 months? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I was so, just. Well, you even had your own answer. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> each uh, pay, they do uh, a transfer, um, and it basically takes the 10 month worth of uh, salary and it spreads it out so that they receive equivalent payments through summertime. So we move that into the account to pay them out over the summer. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Further comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay, the motion is carried. Did we have a seconder on that? Yes, we did. We had Trustee Eddie, I believe. No, Franklin, Trustee Franklin, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move to uh, item 14B, which will be finance, finance warrant number three and the suggested motion. Is it finance warrant number three, dated March 31, 2021, be accepted as presented? Do we have a mover for that? Trustee Eddie, seconded by Trustee Franklin. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Okay, the motion is carried. All right, so we will now move to item number 15, which is the BC. Uh, STA AGM and uh, Trustee McMahon and I are on that list. Uh, did you want to address that Trustee McMahon before I do or? Uh, no, you can go ahead. You, you've already alluded to the uh, painful business of sitting in front of a screen or two screens over the period of a beautiful Friday and Saturday. Yeah, for 16 hours. <laughs> OK, um, the BCSTA annual general meeting took place on April 16th and 17th. Uh, there were approximately 210 trustees in attendance during the meeting, including five from our, our district. Attending from School District 72 for all or parts of the meeting were Trustee Shannon Briggs and Trustees Joyce McMahon, Susan Wilson, Kat Eddy and me. Um, Friday's session began at 8.30 a.m. and ran until 4 p.m. with several breaks during the day. The first order of business was to deal with five extraordinary motions and trustees who planned to attend met with teams after the last board meeting. That's the trustees in our district who planned to attend met with teams after the last board meeting to determine how School District 72's ballots would be cast. The allocation of ballots for candidates for the five directors positions were also decided. Uh, just a brief aside, School District 72 had four ballots for each uh, motion and so or for each candidate and four ballots for each motion and we had to decide how we were going to cast our ballots prior because the board chair um, cast those ballots on behalf of the board. Uh, so board chairs were required to cast ballots for the district so it's quite useful to have the allocation of votes predetermined and based on candidate statements and on trustees past experiences with some of the candidates. The five successful candidates for, were Donna Sargent, John Chenoweth, Tim Bennett, Rick Price and Tracy Loeffler. All five extraordinary motions were passed with the five direct and the five directors were elected all on first ballots. The discussion after discussion, a two year term for directors was approved with the first two year elections to take place at the 2023 AGM just uh, for the purposes of timing with the with the trustee elections. Also changed was the role of the past president, which was changed from a director's uh, voting position to a non-voting member of the board of directors for a period of one year after the end of their presidency. This allows for the election of all five directors for two year terms. 
The motion to restrict the dissemination of FSA results to boards and parents submitted by school district 72 and 8 was passed um, as amended by the phrase until all until other methods of assessments can be developed that accurately reflects the learning styles of all students. All 42 motions were disposed of with only two motions going down to defeat, which speaks to the thoughtfulness that uh, those motions, um, the thoughtfulness with which those motions were uh, put together and brought to the brought to the um, assembly. Many of the motions passed had the common theme of government's chronic underfunding of the public education system. So thanks to the trustees who take uh, who took the time to attend this meeting on a beautiful sunny Campbell River weekend. Um, Trustee Matt, did you have anything to add? Uh, just maybe that I found it um, interesting to hear from former finance minister Carol James, who of course, knowing her history, she started out as a trustee and kind of moved through the political universe to end up in our provincial government. But she had her um, roots in early childhood education. So I first encountered her as a an early childhood advocate probably 20 years ago. So um, it was nice to hear her talk about the value that we need to place on relationships in all the work that we do, um, that trustees in school districts need to rely heavily on the relationships that they can forge with their communities in order to um, make their work both relevant and powerful within those communities. And the other uh, person who spoke was Minister Whiteside. And again, she spoke, um, about relationships and she talked about mental health, her themes around embracing a concept of holistic education that looks at the many ways in which um, our environments impact the way that we're able to learn. So th those were um, interesting highlights for me. And also Carol James is uh... I'm just just talking about the struggles that she's been facing in her own personal life with the diagnosis. I think it's Parkinson's disease. And how she's coping mm -hmm. with it and, and talk about an incredibly powerful and strong woman. Um, mm -hmm. I think she's probably maybe one of the best premiers that British Columbia never had. <laughs> any other any questions or comments about this? OK, well, thank you very much. And the next one is the Vista AGM, and I'll ask for your assistance in that. Did you did you wish to address that one, uh, Trustee McMahon? I had a lot of trouble with Vista. I, I got the first 15 minutes and then I got kicked off and I couldn't get back on and then I got the last five minutes. So there was a big chunk of it that I spent in frustration working with my two screens so i'm not i'm not able to comment on that much there were <clears throat> there were um we have a new president um candace billsbury has stepped down so she's now the past president and uh, elected by acclamation was janice caton who is a trustee from school district 71 that most of us here have had experience with in the past um, also, there were reports, um, Indigenous education, and there were a variety of reports that were done. I was cut off at 28 minutes after 12. It just the meeting dropped and it never came back on for me. Um, but those um, those uh, reports were sent out by email. So anybody who would like to get into, the, you know, dive into it, um, you can go back in your emails and find the report from uh, the Vista meeting that includes all of those sub or those committee reports. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, is there any other, oh sorry, there is other business and that would be uh, on the topic of teachers and that's uh, Trustee Hagen, you wish to speak to that? Yes, I did. Uh, I just want to make sure I was, my mic was on. Uh, recently, uh, I, I have to say I, I wasn't very well. I, as you know, I have diabetes and lost a leg and some toes. Um, and as uh, I've been doing quite well, it was quite sudden that all of a sudden I was faced with uh, perhaps losing uh, 
another leg, uh, huge infection, um, spent a month and a half on drip IVs and all kinds of uh, uh, antibiotics. I lost 30 pounds, so there's a good side to it all. And uh, I wanted to say that I understand how fragile life can seem sometimes, that uh, we're going through COVID, we can't really talk about our issues, we, uh, oh, we get cut off in traffic, we become angry, uh, we're trying to do the best that we can. And I have to say that uh, we just need to keep on keeping on. We can't lose who we are in the middle of whether we're not feeling well or like right now, I'm speaking to teachers who are in the middle of this pandemic, going to a classroom day after day. And I want to encourage you that you just have to keep going on. And we're here for you. As a board, we understand the difficulties you're going through. We understand that there's a lot of turmoil. Um, and I understand that we are fragile, all of us. And I want you to know that our thoughts are with you in the classroom. Uh, and I can't say anything more is that we're behind you and we understand what you're going through. And if anyone, I understand what's, what it's like to be fragile. And to come out the other side, I'm feeling great and I'm feeling better every day. And so I'm just saying there's hope. If we just keep on going, don't lose our spirit and, and just be positive inside yourself to say, I can beat this thing, I can do this, and I'm not going to let it change who I am. And if that happens to be the COVID or kids in the classroom or difficulties at home, I'm <coughs> gonna encourage you to not let circumstances change who you are. And I've seen our district, I've seen our teachers, the extra effort that's been going in and please don't let circumstances change who you are. That there's a fight to be fought and we're gonna win this and we're gonna win it together. And I, from the beginning, I've said, we're in this step by step together. And if we can work with you, be with you, encourage you in any way possible. I want to say times are fragile, but we've got each other. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Trustee. Thank you. I think I speak on behalf of the board um, when I say that I'm glad that you've uh, that you've uh, I wouldn't say that you're fully recovered yet, but you're well on the way to recovery and uh, we're glad to have you back in maybe a, a, redu a reduced uh, form, but we're glad to have you back. So uh, I appreciate keep, that. Keep going. Good luck with the rest of your recovery. Thanks. OK, um, so now we will move to questions from anyone present on the from anyone present on the agenda item for the meeting at this point. Uh, Ms. Patrick, do we have any questions? No questions have come in so far. OK, we will give a we'll give uh, all those people out there in uh, Internet land a couple of minutes to uh, respond if they have anything that they wish to have addressed. That, that was on the agenda this evening. Well, while, while we're waiting, I, I, I was sorry to miss that interesting 16 hour days you guys had uh, <laughs> i just wasn't up to it i just couldn't do it so i apologize for not being there for 16 hours <laughs> it it was certainly a different experience um to sit in front of a tv screen from 8 30 on friday morning until four o'clock there was a bit of a break about a 20 minute break at lunchtime plus i guess you could turn off your camera and wander away for various reasons and then we started again at 8.30 on Saturday morning and it was supposed to be, the meeting was scheduled to be over by four. It was extended till five because we had eight or 10 motions to finish. Um, it was extended again and we finished, we finished Saturday's meeting at 5.29. So um, it, it, was, uh, it was a long time to be sitting 
in front of a screen in a Zoom meet, in a in a Zoom meeting. I hope we don't have to do it again. <laughs> yeah. I really miss Kevin because when we're sitting around a table and something comes up, Kevin was always there to ask the questions to. Kevin, how do we do this? Kevin, what happens? And he wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing was it was just. It was really um, not as full or complete an experience as being there in person because during the during debate on some of the items, sometimes you can have a side conversation respectfully, of course, uh, but there are certain things that you might want to have clarified that somebody in our group would be able to address rather than to have to uh, either have the question go unanswered or else to have to try and find out from the meeting. So we didn't we didn't have the advantage of the I guess the combined experience and, and intelligence of the, of the 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 attendees to draw on when we had questions or clarifications that we needed to um, uh, sort out. OK, uh, do we have any further questions? No, we do not. I think it's safe to adjourn. OK, Trustee Hagan, please. Move adjournment. All those in favor, raise your hands. We are done. Thank you very much. We will meet, I guess, in about five minutes to complete the business of the confidential.